You might not want to believe this, but the place that you're sitting right now is filled with things that are quietly destroying your productivity. This is especially true if you're currently sitting here, but also true even if you're sitting here. Today, we are going over four ways in which your workspace, your environment, is probably harming your ability to stay focused on your work. These are issues that can be so distracting that some people will go to extreme lengths to escape them. And one of those people is Peter Shankman, an author who has publicly talked about his struggles with ADHD. And a few years ago, Peter bought a $5,000 round trip ticket from his hometown in New Jersey to Tokyo, Japan. And after spending 14 hours flying to Tokyo, he got right back on the exact same plane and flew all the way back home. He didn't even stop to see the life-size Gundam, which is a missed opportunity if I've ever seen one. So why would someone spend $5,000 in 26 hours of their life just to fly halfway across the world and right back home? Well, as Peter tells it, he was working on a book and he was coming dangerously close to his publisher's deadline. He couldn't get himself to focus at home, so he decided to put himself in the one place where he would have no access to his phone, to the internet, or to any distractions whatsoever, a tiny cramped airplane cabin. And it worked. He wrote chapters one through five on the way to Tokyo and six through 10 on his way back, landing with a finished first draft. And this, even though it is completely ridiculous, is my favorite example of what a good environment can do for your focus. And on the flip side, what a bad environment can do to rob you of your potential. So let's meet our four workplace productivity destroyers, or the four horsemen of the productivity apocalypse, and see what we can do to fix them, preferably without buying a $5,000 plane ticket. And we'll start with the one that I personally have the most trouble with, paths of lesser resistance. See, most work worth doing is difficult, which means you're almost always going to encounter resistance when you try to do it. Your brain doesn't want to go through the difficulty involved, so it looks for an escape route. And it's easy to identify the usual suspects here, right? TikTok, Twitter, that game on your phone, all offer up these bite-sized hits of dopamine that are available at a moment's notice. But I think there's an even more insidious form of distraction that's even harder to deal with. Other work, the 50 unanswered emails in your inbox, that unpaid toll bill that you gotta pay at some point, these all have to get done as well, so it's easy to justify switching over to them when you feel a little bit stuck on your main task. But here's the problem. Every time you switch from one task to another, you deal with something called attention residue. Part of your attention remains with the unfinished task that you switched away from, making it harder to fully concentrate on your current task. As Cal Newport points out in his book, Deep Work, this residue gets especially thick if your work on task A was unbounded and of low intensity before you switched. And these are perfect descriptors for those little tasks like checking your email. So it's no wonder that it's so difficult to get back into the flow state when you switch back to your main task. And this is why Peter Shankman's flight to Tokyo was so useful. Sitting up in that cramped airplane cabin with no internet, he had little to do but write his book. Now, you don't have to go blow your life savings on a trans-specific plane ticket to get the same benefit. And honestly, I think part of his reason for doing it was to get a good story out of it. And hey, here I am telling it to you. But all you need to do is follow a simple rule. Clear everything out of your workspace that doesn't have to do with the task at hand. The closer all these other things are, the easier it's gonna be for your brain to want to switch to them. Start by clearing off your desk. Put any loose papers in an inbox, get any visual clutter out of the way, and consider a small set of drawers so you can keep things out of sight and out of mind until you actually need them. I've got this nice little one from Ikea that also doubles as a charging station for my camera batteries. Once that's done, it's time to look at something even more important, which is your computer. As Chris Bailey points out in his book, Hyperfocus, on average, we work for only 40 seconds when working on a computer before either being interrupted or distracted. A huge reason for this is that we love to leave tabs and windows open that are completely unrelated to the work that we're trying to do. So one way that I combat this is during that five minute prep I talked about in the last video, I take the time to close anything that is completely unrelated to my task. And if I don't wanna lose something, I'll paste research links into Notion. Now, if that's not enough for you, you can also opt for the nuclear option. Distraction blockers, apps like Cold Turkey and Freedom. These let you define a list of apps and websites that are gonna be blocked during your work sessions. And then either during specific hours or when you tell it that you're starting a work session, you're not gonna be able to access those at all. And that is actually helpful for our second horseman of the productivity apocalypse, which are active distractions. Now, these typically break down into two different categories, notifications on your devices and distractions in your immediate physical environment. So let's first start with notifications. And I'll just tell you what I do here. I disable pretty much every notification that could possibly reach me, except for messages on my phone, SMS text messages, and certain people DMing me in Slack. And when I really need to focus, I double down on this by enabling do not disturb mode on my phone. That way nothing can break through so I can really concentrate, especially when I'm doing research or writing video scripts. Another idea that your brain 
brain is probably going to throw up some resistance to is, hey, maybe turn off your phone or put it in another room. And if you are feeling resistance to this, simply ask yourself when you need to work, do I need my phone for the next 45 minutes? The answer is probably no. The other source of active distractions are in your immediate physical environment. It can include things like people interrupting you or cats interrupting you, loud noises, and the arrival of Galactus in the end times. Surprise, mother Whatever it is, try to predict what those distractions could be and then see what you can do to get rid of them or keep them from happening in the first place. For example, telling your friends or your family that you need an hour of uninterrupted time is a great way to prevent interruptions. And for loud noises, a good pair of headphones is really, really nice, especially if they are noise canceling. Now, for the arrival of Galactus, practice breaking your concentration, I haven't quite figured out a solution, but I do think I'm close to cracking the code. While I'm finishing that up, let's talk about our third horseman of the productivity apocalypse, which is ergonomics, or rather, poor ergonomics. Now, ergonomics is the study and science of fitting the workplace to the individual, making you more comfortable while you work. And it is here that I will assert Peter Shankman's airplane workspace wasn't so good. I fly for work a few times a month, and I find airplane seats to be horrendously uncomfortable. Now, maybe this is due to the fact that I'm over six feet tall, but I think most people would agree with me here. Now, there are definitely some things that you can do to tailor your workspace for better ergonomics, which will make you more comfortable and also help you to avoid some chronic injuries over over time, which can definitely destroy your productivity. But we have to talk about the most important aspect of ergonomics first, which is movement and exercise. I can't tell you about any fancy desks or chairs before we talk about this, because I have literally seen people who I know go out and buy super fancy, expensive thousand dollar ergonomic office chairs, and then be lulled into a false sense of security, thinking the chair is all they need to prevent injuries. That is not the case. The chair might help, but alone it is inadequate. And I have experience with this. A few years ago, I did a whole bunch of research and I went out and I bought a fancy ergonomic chair for my studio workstation. And a few years ago, I also went through a period of constant chronic back pain sitting in that fancy chair. So the chair did not fix it. In fact, no single tweak to my workspace fixed my chronic back pain. What fixed it was exercise and flexibility training, specifically some yoga moves that helped to increase the flexibility and mobility in my hamstrings and leg muscles, but even more importantly, squats and deadlifts. Weight training that strengthened both my core and my back muscles so they could actually support my spinal column. Take this seriously and prevent your future self chronic pain if you don't have it already. Get up at least once an hour, move around, go for a walk, and ideally go to the gym sometimes or have some kind of resistance training program so you're strengthening your body and not letting it atrophy in a thousand dollar computer chair. And speaking of those chairs, how important is it to get a super fancy ergonomic chair in the first place? Well, if you ask the marketing departments, the companies that make them, they will say it's very important indeed. But personally, I'm a bit more skeptical. I think movement is the number one factor. And beyond that, I'm not convinced about all the science and fancy research that's gone into every aspect of these chairs and how they contour to your body. But what I do think is important is to get a chair that can adjust its height. And if you can do the same with your desk, that's useful as well. I've got a sit stand desk that lets me make minute adjustments to the height, but even if you can't afford that, there are cheaper desks like at Ikea that have adjustable height legs so you can make your desk the right height for you. And what is that right height? Well, actually, if I switch back over to this camera, I can physically demonstrate it. So first, chair height should be set so that your feet are flat on the ground or barring that on a footstool. Don't have them dangling. Second, set your desk height or adjust the chair height so that your elbows are about a 90 degree angle. You don't wanna be reaching up with your fingers. And lastly, with your monitor, you wanna add about eye level. The top of the monitor should be right with your eyes. And laptops actually present a problem there because you put them on the table and now you're staring down the laptop craning your neck, which can cause pain after a while. So ideally, if you're gonna work on a laptop, you wanna get a laptop stand that you can put the laptop on and then get an external keyboard and mouse so you're not reaching up to that stand. So now we have perfected your ergonomics, we have turned off notifications, and we've dealt with those paths of lesser resistance. But still, at this point, your workspace might be missing something. It might be uninspiring. And I think this is important to talk about because the environment you put yourself in has a huge effect on your mindset. When I'm in an area that makes me feel muted, bored, uncreative, I can't do my best work. And I think you would agree here. So let's talk about some changes we can make to our workplaces and our environments to make them just a bit more inspiring. Now, this is absolutely something that varies from person to person. So what I want to do here is simply share some things that I've done with my own workspace that make me feel a lot better about doing my work. First and foremost, I love bright open spaces. I 
ideally with sunlight. And also I like having a workspace with plants. This is a fake plant. It would die down here in this studio if it was real, but real plants are a great addition to your workspace, I think. And there's actually some research to show that nature exposure, and I think bringing some nature into your workspace has some cognitive benefits. So maybe go out and add a plant to your workspace and see what that does. I also love working with tools that let me work as close to the speed of my thoughts as possible. Now this varies based on the task. If I'm writing a script, really all I need is my laptop. But if I'm editing a video or designing a new template in Notion, I love having my dual monitor workstation so I can see everything all at once. And I also swear by gaming mice because the high DPI sensors make them much easier and more comfortable to use even when I'm doing regular work tasks. So those are just some suggestions that work for me, but they might work for you as well. And overall, ask yourself, is my workspace inspiring to me? Is it a place where I actually wanna get my work done? And if it's not, what can I do to change that? So now that we've tackled your workspace and fixed that, let's talk about something much bigger that needs fixing as well. So this is where I would normally tell you about my video sponsor, CuriosityStream, but they have been kind enough to actually donate this sponsor spot to let me tell you about Team C's. Remember last year when Mr. Beast and a ton of other content creators got together to raise $20 million and plant 20 million trees? Well, this year we are doing something very similar, but we are also raising the stakes. Team C's is a global campaign to raise $30 million and remove 30 million pounds of trash from our planet's oceans, rivers, and beaches. For every dollar that's raised, one full pound of trash will be removed. And we have partnered with two different organizations to accomplish this. The Ocean Conservancy will be tackling the oceans and the beaches, and the Ocean Cleanup will be cleaning up the rivers with their interceptor units, preventing trash from ever reaching the oceans in the first place. Personally, I was incredibly impressed with Team Trees last year, especially since they actually reached their goal. And this year, I love the precedent that Team Seas is now setting, the pattern it's setting, that every year, content creators like myself and my friends can come together with our audiences, with you guys, to band together and do something truly big and truly good for the environment. So personally, I'll be making a donation. And if you'd like to help the cause as well, there's going to be a link in the description down below or in the pinned comment. Beyond that, now that you're finished watching this video, check out this one right here on a three-step process you can easily follow to more reliably get yourself into the flow state. Or if you're curious about how I'm currently doing my task management, I've got a video right here on my second channel on my Notion task management system, which is actually a free template as well. So check that out. Follow me on Twitter for bite-sized content. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed and thanks for watching. Hit the like button for the algorithm and I'll see you in the next one.